Good afternoon, everyone. I am Rachel Savasic Luxton. I'm the Director of Research and Training here for the Dibble Institute, and I'm thrilled to welcome you all to today's webinar, Experiences of Peer Educators Teaching Relationship Education to College Students. We're honored and thrilled to have Drs. Alyssa McElwain and Dr. Vanessa Finnegan here to present on this topic, and I'll introduce them in just a moment. But before we do, I have a little bit of housekeeping items um, before we get started. So if we can go to the next slide. There we go. Just a couple of things for technical questions. If you're having a hard time hearing us, the email invitation that you got does provide a phone number that you can use to access the audio for today's session. So you can call in and access it that way. If there's anything else technically wrong, um, you can sign out and log back in. That usually solves the issue. Um, you know, the usual reboot if technology doesn't work. We also want to point out um, that there's a hand in the control panel. We'd like to see if you are new to the Dibble Institute's webinar. So if everybody can take a minute and find the raise hand function in the control panel, I'd love to just get a feel for how many of you are new to us today. I'll give you all a second to do that. Okay. See a couple of new folks, but it seems like a lot of you may be joining us. Um, as a, a repeat webinar attendee. So glad to have you back and glad to have all of our new folks here today. I also want to point out that any handouts that you might um, want for this can be found in your control panel. And that's also where the questions box can be located. So we will have time about 10 to 15 minutes at the end of this session for Q&A. So just so everyone knows, um, go ahead and submit those there and we'll answer them at the end of the session. And there will be a recording of this session, including the slides available to you several days after the webinar, and the link will be sent out for that. So with that, let's go ahead and take a quick moment to introduce, especially those of you who are new to us, um, to the Dibble Institute and let you know how we got our name. So on the slide here, you're gonna see a picture of Charlie and Helen Dibble. They are the founders of the Dibble Institute. And Charlie did a lot of work with youth during his retirement. And he saw that a lot of them were having difficulties around their relationships or when their parents were having difficulties with their relationships, it was impacting those young people he was working with. So he had the brilliant idea to translate research into teaching tools that could then be made widely available. So while the Dibble Institute is not a direct service provider, we develop research-based practices and make them available for people like you who are attending our webinar. And I wanna point out on the next slide that thanks to you all um, and the clients that we have in all 50 states, and even other countries who are providing direct services, based on our conservative estimates, we believe that our clients reached over 119,000 youth based on materials purchased. So just wanna take a quick moment to say that we are very grateful to all of you who are here doing this important work with young people. So thank you for all that you all are doing, or maybe we'll start doing after joining us on today's session. The other thing I want to highlight about the Dibble Institute, other than we are a national independent nonprofit organization, is our mission. So our mission is to help young people successfully navigate their intimate lives um, and intimate relationships through important information to help build their knowledge and um, skills around relationship skill building through these different practices. We know that having these conversations with young people pulls a lot of levers. So it's pregnancy prevention, dating violence prevention, mental health lever and job readiness and even more. So in addition to our mission, we are also guided by our values. And the first value that I wanna highlight is that we are big believers in research here at the Dibble Institute. All of our programs are research-based and we continue to strive for evaluations in our programs to really demonstrate their impact and their effectiveness. And this also means uh, why we have updates to our programs as we learn new information. Our other value that guides our work is that we believe in safe, stable, and nurturing and healthy families of all different formations. And our goal is for young people to be raised in these families. And lastly, we believe that relationship education is for everyone. All of us can improve our relationships and we make sure that our programs are reflective of that and inclusive and the, the work that we do and the, the products that we create or the programs that we create. So to turn our attention to the reason you are all here today, I wanna take a moment now to introduce our presenters. And the first one is Dr. Alyssa McElwain. She is an Associate Professor of Human Development and Family Studies at the University of Wyoming. 
Her research focuses on adolescent and emerging relationships, emerging adult relationships, with the focus on preventative relationship education programs. Alyssa has coordinated peer-led relationship education programming for both high school and college student audiences. She recently worked as the evaluator for a federally funded youth-focused relationship education program that reached over 2,000 youth per year. And she's also actively involved in creating novel, engaging educational materials for adolescents to promote healthy individual and relational outcomes. We also have Dr. Vanessa Finnegan, who currently serves as the Senior Analyst Assessment and Strategic Planning and as an adjunct faculty member at Auburn University. For over a decade, she was involved in the management, planning, implementing, and evaluating a federally funded healthy marriage and relationship education projects, not just one, several. And Vanessa has extensive experience in school and community-based um, program implementation and in training educators to facilitate healthy relationship materials for young people. As a certified family life educator, she is deeply committed to supporting adolescents and setting positive trajectories by providing research-informed prevention education. So they are absolutely wonderful individuals doing great work in their communities. They are also dear friends of mine. So with that, I will turn it over to Vanessa and Alyssa to present their information. Thank you, Rachel, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and thank you all for choosing to spend an hour of your day with us today. We are extremely excited for this opportunity to share our work with you. I presume that many of you, um, including Vanessa and I, typically focus on the experience of program participants of the work that we're doing. Today, we're going to shift the focus a bit, and we're gonna focus more on the facilitators than the audience members to see what it's like to be a novice peer educator of relationship education. And we really hope that you'll find something that you can apply to your own work from our presentation today. Before we get started, I wanted to go ahead and give you an overview of what we'll be talking about. So first, um, we'll discuss the rationale for using peer education, why this is an approach that can be very feasible with relationship education audiences. I'll give an overview of the program that was conducted here at the University of Wyoming. And then Vanessa is going to walk us through the methods that we use to understand the peer educators themselves and what they experienced. And we'll both share with you the important findings that we have from the phenomenological study we conducted. And we'll wrap up with some of the major implications of this work and, of course, time for your questions and discussion that comes from our presentation. So to get started, I wanted to just broadly describe service learning because this is the overall framework through which we um, conducted the peer education program. So service learning is a type of experiential learning in which students provide a service to the community as the basis for their education. So the work that we're sharing with you today, or in the work we're sharing, the service that was provided was community education programming, specifically relationship education. In service learning, the course objectives are met by student reflection and processing of their experience providing that service. Service learning is a really beneficial approach for undergraduates because it provides them with real world opportunities for them to identify possible careers and develop really important professional skills that are relevant to their career trajectories. So for instance, they can develop very advanced public speaking skills, such as group facilitation skills, which as we know, is far more difficult than delivering um, a lecture. Um, they can develop teamwork, leadership, cultural competence, and important teaching skills, which are highly desirable traits um, for future professionals in a variety of human service fields. So building this type of service learning into undergraduate coursework can have really positive implications for students and the field that they will one day enter. A specific way for college students to serve their campus community is through peer education. So fun fact is that my work with peer education began way back in 2005 when I was a peer sexual health educator at Kansas State University. We were invited into classrooms to give one-time educational presentations about sexual health. The experience, as you can imagine, was both terrifying and rewarding, but in the end, I learned a lot about myself and the content we were teaching. So this is actually a fairly common approach to health promoting and prevention programs on college campuses. 
For instance, programs that aim to reduce sexual risk taking, substance use, they frequently will have similar aged peers trained to deliver that educational material. So sure, these programs can be a lot more fun, or maybe a little, little bit less awkward when they're taught by somebody who is close to your age. But do they actually meet the targeted program outcomes? Because that's what we're really focused on, right? And research shows that overall, peer educators are effective in promoting change in health behaviors like smoking, alcohol use, physical fitness, and sexual behaviors. Large research, study, research studies also find that peer educators can also improve their own health behaviors as a result of being a peer educator. So overall, these peer educators are successful in promoting health in their peers within these prevention programs. Well, why is that? The reason is that they bridge the gap between formal health education and the lived experiences of young adults or younger people. Their relatability, trustworthiness, and their ability to customize messaging really makes them effective agents of change in the realm of young adult health promotion and prevention. So for this reason and another important reason, their own development, we wanted to look at um, how young adults development and learning might align with this experience to kind of say, this is why the approach is beneficial for, um, or may have impacts on these peer educators. So using this framework is really suitable for young adults because adult learning often involves someone taking a lot more initiative in their own learning and taking what they've previously learned, that body of knowledge they've amassed, to apply it to solve real world problems. Well, if you ask college students what some of the uh, real world issues they see are, they likely will say that they are worried about many things, but one of them would be perhaps how do we prevent dating violence? Or perhaps they see either themselves or their peers struggling with romantic relationships. So how can we improve them? So these are very relevant problems in their worlds that they would be interested and um, engaged in solving. Other reasons this is an appropriate method for young adults or framework for young adults uh, as peer educators is that they have a focus on exploring their personal and occupational domains of identity, meaning that they're really wanting to figure themselves out and try to find careers uh, that are a good fit for them with their skill sets. So they need that opportunity to explore. Finally, they also have a focus at this age uh, on intimate relationships. And so the content of healthy marriage relationship education is also applicable to their own uh, personal and relational development. So there's uh, several things that we have observed in the research that peer educators are likely to experience. And that is that they are likely to have some positive effects. But it's also possible that these challenges they would experience um, could lead to potential negative effects. So first, with the positive things that peer educators might experience, we know that teaching a subject requires a deep understanding of the material. Peer educators often find that they learn more about a topic as they prepare to teach it, which can lead to a much more comprehensive understanding of content. Not surprisingly, teaching to others and successfully conveying information and helping peers can be a really rewarding experience that increases your sense of confidence. Peer educators also tend to develop their leadership skills because they're able to take charge, organize sessions, and guide discussions. Being an effective teacher often involves very good written and oral communication skills, which as we know are essential in our lives. And finally, another benefit is that they may experience greater empathy for individuals with diverse learning styles and greater understanding um, for diverse groups. This experience, though, um, it's understood that it's not without challenge. Um, peer educators might feel pressure to pe perform well, especially if their peers are relying entirely on them for learning. And so that can sometimes be stressful. Balancing the role of being a peer and a teacher can be a little bit tricky, so it's really important for them to learn how to navigate those relationships and balance those roles by establishing good boundaries. There also, during this experience, might be instances where peers disagree with the information or the way it's presented. And so handling conflicts with the students or the learners in the room in a constructive and non-confrontational way is really important. 
And then finally, of course, as we know, if you are around college students, um, their schedules are quite packed. So time management um, is something that they can develop as a skill, but it also can put a strain on them through this experience. So peer education itself has been studied extensively, particularly with young adults. Yet we know less about their experience teaching similar aged peers about relationship education. So before I describe the peer education approach in general, I wanted to take a moment and explain some of the reasons why we chose to prioritize young adult audiences, so people who are very close in age to them. As we know, during this stage of life, there are many benefits to romantic relationships. However, people who are in unhealthy relationships are more likely to experience a variety of negative outcomes like worse academic outcome, alcohol use, um, and greater uh, risk for mental and physical health problems. We also have research indicating that relationship aggression tends to peak during young adulthood at the time when they might be engaging in these relationships. So this is where HMRE comes in, which is Healthy Marriage and Relationship Education. HMRE teaches key knowledge and skills to prevent abuse and improve mate selection, conflict management, and relationship maintenance. I want to point out something important, that if you're on a college campus or you partner with college campuses, there's a potential synergy um, on campus or with universities. There are many university initiatives that exist to prevent dating violence and sexual assault, which are serious forms of interpersonal aggression we want to prevent. In my conversations with our campus leaders for these initiatives, they agreed that they are focused solely on preventing those extremely negative behaviors. And rightfully so, we have shockingly high numbers of those behaviors. However, we all agree that there's a missing piece to solving this issue and that there could be more focus on primary prevention, that is psychoeducation that's going to promote positive relationship skills, especially the ability to er recognize early warning signs of abuse. So as my colleagues and I here at UW have said, HMRE for young adults is a crucial piece of the prevention pie for young adult audiences. So now I would like to go into more detail about the program itself. So the Peer Education Project was called the Relationship Education and Leadership Project. And this was a course that was promoted to social science majors across campus, so psychology, social work, human development, and family science. It was a highly structured experience um, in which they enrolled in one to two credits and we had regular meeting times and training, which I'll describe in a minute. The peer educators were responsible for a variety of tasks, including marketing and recruitment of participants, making appropriate adaptations to the lessons. So for instance, pre-selecting any scenarios they wanted to use in an activity, which is the photo you see here on the screen. They were required to practice lessons with their co-facilitator and teach lessons to their peers who were around ages 18 to 25. They also assisted in the classroom or at the events as participant observers, meaning they would lend a hand to pass out handouts or answer questions as needed. So the peer educators in the real program were not just handed a binder and told, good luck. There was actually a really in-depth training procedure throughout the semester. So peer educators were trained to teach select uh, love notes lessons. So we did a one day orientation to the love notes material. And then throughout the semester, we have weekly 90 minute meetings that towards the beginning were heavily focused on training. Then as we moved into implementation, we focused greatly on processing that, what's going well, what can we work on, um, what are the challenges and successes we're having. And then finally, towards the end of the semester, focusing on professional implications of that experience. So this is a training method that we used uh, that we think was highly effective. So they, we randomly assigned teachbacks. So essentially, um, all students would prepare to teach session one materials. And then the day of our meeting, I would say, okay, you and you are going to present our session one materials. And they would be prepared, but they didn't know they were presenting that day. So everyone had an equal level of responsibility to be familiar with the lessons. These teach back sessions provided an opportunity that was safe and comfortable and really low stakes to give them peer feedback, for me as the instructor to give examples 
um, of how to explain something or how to um, kind of have different levels of excitement and energy and how that kind of affects the audience. We also presented them with challenging scenarios like what if you ask a question and nobody answers? What are you going to do in that situation? So we would pretend the other peers and myself as the instructor would pretend to be audience members so they could practice in real time those challenges they might face. In terms of program implementation, our HMRE programming was delivered to participants who had an average age of 20, so just a couple years younger than our peer educators on average. We delivered the material during two hour sessions across four weeks. For every session, a team of four students led the, the work. So we had two facilitators at all times and two active participants in the room. Session topics aligned with core love notes topics such as personality styles, principles of healthy relationships, communication skills, family background, technology and relationships, dating aggression, and sexual decision making. We also presented, as time allowed for these uh, peer educators, one-time events for student athletes and members of the Panhellenic community here on campus. All right, so that wraps up the background information about our peer education framework for delivering HMRE. So next, Vanessa will walk us through our study. Uh oh, it would seem like Vanessa, we might have lost your audio. Let's see. Hmm. Do you want to mute and then unmute? You know, these should mute, unmute, and see if that does the trick. Okay. No, it is cut out for some strange reason. Um. Uh, Esther, you're our tech guru. Anything, yeah. that, any yeah. other suggestions that you might have? Um, we might need to take a brief pause and have Dr. Finnegan um, exit and re-enter the presentation. This is pretty abnormal. Um, not exactly sure why this is going on right now, but we'll just take a brief break. I can continue on with our research questions while we're waiting if you want. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, Great. Vanessa, I'll go through the research questions and we'll pick up when you're back in. So overall, our research questions were guided by um, sort of what we had experienced both with our experiences as leaders of these programs as well as what we have observed in the research about peer educators and service learning. So we asked two research questions. First, we asked, what practical and personal gains do peer educators experience delivering HMRE within a service learning course? Second, we asked what interpersonal challenges and lessons learned do peer educators experience delivering HMRE in a service learning course? So really focused on that kind of interpersonal experience. So we took a qualitative research approach. Vanessa is back. Am I back? Can you hear me? I can hear you. All right. We're still on research right. questions, and I just read through the questions, so I was about to tell them about our qualitative research approach on this slide. Awesome. All right. So, um, as Alyssa went ahead and set us up with our research questions, you can see that we were really focused and interested in understanding the peer educators' unique experiences in the service learning course, and not only a service learning course, but a service learning course that was focused on delivering healthy marriage and relationship education programming. And so our questions really lent themselves well to taking a qualitative research approach. So that's what we did. Um, we led there and we were able to explore the practical, personal, and interpersonal um, impacts from this experience of serving as a peer educator of HMRE based on the student's own experiences in their own words as captured through a reflection paper assignment that they completed as part of course requirements. So the typical focus in program evaluation research is on the enrolled program participants. And of course that makes sense. But yet we find that the peer educators are key participants in the program delivery experience, especially when 
their young adult emerging professionals teaching peers. So our study included 15 of 17 students who enrolled in service learning to serve as peer educators. And the opportunity to enroll in the service learning course uh, for the real program was offered across four academic semesters and the time frame was from fall 2018 to spring 2020. And these courses were held at the University of Wyoming, uh, which is a public land grant university. Our peer educators were mostly juniors and seniors, were on average 21 years old and mostly identified as white and female. And because this opportunity was opened up to students from all majors, we did have students with diverse majors um, and peer educators included students majoring in human development and family science, psychology, social work, communications, zoology, and elementary education. So pretty diverse backgrounds. And then lastly, there was no requirement to have any prior experience with service learning or any kind of program facilitation. And so the students in our study had no prior service learning experience. For the purpose of the study, Alyssa, as the project director and course instructor, provided the peer educators with a nice description of our research project. And then they were invited to participate if they were interested. And so for the students who were interested, they signed an informed consent before they submitted a final reflection paper as part of the class. And so during this description of the project, Alyssa assured them that their participation was voluntary and that there wouldn't be any consequences for choosing not to participate. And we had two peer educators who just didn't turn in an informed consent. And so they weren't included in our study. And also just to note this here, there are multiple peer educators who came back um, after that first semester being enrolled in service learning, um, but we only included peer educators once and we limited our data source to the papers that they completed during their first semester of service learning and delivering HMRE. And so that way we were capturing that experience from peer educators with no prior service learning or program delivery experience. Okay. Tell you a little bit about our data collection. So the practice of reflection to promote learning and understand student experiences is a key element in service learning. So as part of documenting their service learning experience and their professional responsibilities, our peer educators completed three reflection papers. And these reflection papers were scheduled at strategic times throughout the semester. And so they completed a paper at the beginning, in the middle, and the end of the semester. The data source for our study included the peer educator's third and final reflection paper, which was written in response to three wide open-ended question prompts. The prompts were, what happened? What have you learned? Now, what will you do? And this what, so what, now what format of reflection is an established and recommended method utilized in the assessment of student experiences and service learning. Also, to reduce biased responses and make it clear that the nature of their experiences, not whether experiences were negative or positive, um, was what we were hoping to have uh, the reflections show and illuminate, um, the instructions specifically stated that reflections will be evaluated on whether students address the prompts thoroughly, not based on whether the responses were positive or negative. In our analysis, we were interested in understanding, again, the, the what kinds of gains and the what kinds of challenges were experienced. So we implemented an interpretive phenomenological approach that allowed us to really dive into that what and, and what the peer educators had experienced as active participants in the real program is what we were truly after understanding. We approached our data analysis as an iterative collaborative process. We really took our time here um, we started off with having a planning meeting where Alyssa and I met and we just started off with acknowledging our potential biases. Alyssa and I, for example, both have a vested interest in this research um, where we both have served as instructors of service learning and so we're very passionate about our students and this work. We're also very passionate about relationship education and so we had to acknowledge that coming in. We also have a lot of experience with HMRE and delivering HMA programming. And so we knew that that would inform our research process. 
So to work with that, we applied Heidegger's method when we were organizing our data. And we did that by organizing data by our research questions. So those two questions we opened up with. Then we each engaged independently in line by line open coding of the third and final reflection paper. Papers were about two to three pages each. And we recorded analytic memos. And then Alyssa and I would come together and discuss our analytic memos. Initially, Alyssa had developed a code book, which is where we started. Um, and then we continued to edit and refine that code book throughout the analysis process. Um, again, discussing that coding and examining the different insights that we were pulling using the student's own words. And then we would work through, um, Alyssa and I together, work through and reach consensus when we were coding to kind of, if we had to create new codes and understand what the students were trying to, what, what they were trying to demonstrate. Once we had refined our code book, then we felt we were ready to carry out more focused coding where we looked for um, themes. So we took thematic analysis of the significant statements that we had captured um, from the students' papers. And then to take more of a holistic approach, we also wanted to open it up to unanticipated findings. So in keeping in light of what the students are saying, what could be some unanticipated findings, when we were organizing our findings, we were really intentional to co-construct the gains and challenges that the peer educators had shared by using their own words. And really using their own words is how we work to find the patterns in our data. To verify our initial findings, after Alyssa and I had reached an agreement on, okay, this is what we're seeing here, I sent those findings to all the peer educators and we, we shared it with them, like here, here was the paper you submitted, this is how we, what we have found in the study, and we requested their input on our interpretations of their reflections. And it was great, we had an opportunity um, for the peer educators to share back with us. And overwhelmingly, the responses that we got um, really confirmed that the findings resonated with their experiences and that the significant statements that we had captured were quoted accurately and also within context of what they were sharing. But we also were able to draw from their feedback on our findings to continue to further develop our findings. So for instance, we had a student who informed us that although there were challenges, which was something that we were trying to understand what those were, um, we had a student who shared with us through this member checking process that it was the positive and fun factors that made this experience impactful so much more than the challenges. And so that gave Alyssa and I an opportunity to process that and really fold that into our, our final findings of our study. All right, so our final findings. I'm excited to share with you the findings associated with our first research question which as a reminder was, what practical and personal gains do peer educators experience delivering HMRE within a service learning course? So in total, we found six themes related to this, and I'm going to go through each of the six and describe them uh, using their own words and a little additional information to make sure there's clarity on this. Oops, I've advanced ahead. Okay, so first, peer educators describe that they developed applicable professional skills so many described how service learning offered a unique opportunity to them to develop both knowledge and skills to be better prepared for a range of activities in specifically family science and family life education. So this is important. It's um, kind of new in this work to hear exactly what this is like in HMRE and for family scientists specifically. So for example, one person said, as a childbirth educator, I will need to be able to effectively present material to a group of adults. I will need to build rapport with them and use active listening as they are sharing their experiences. These are all things that I have learned in the service learning course. So really highlighting those specific skills and how this person is going to apply them to their own profession. Our second theme that we found was that peer educators experienced a clearer understanding of the family science career options available to them. So what might be a good fit for them in the future? In particular, this experience with family life education was typically quite novel to them and less understood than other human service fields, such as counseling or social work. So this experience provided them an opportunity to deepen their understanding of family life education and HMRE, 
Um, and so some peers did experience some crystallization of their career plans. For example, one peer educator wrote, I think I may still go into counseling at first and maybe one day I'll start working with nonprofits and other groups to continue to educate. I am a little firmer on my path than I was when I started. Another person said that since family life education could very much be a career path for them in the future, it was the perfect opportunity to gain practice with that activity. So moving on to our third theme for this research question, we found that students described how they applied HMRE topics beyond their service learning duties. So they ended up making connections with other coursework and used HMRE knowledge and skills in their own personal world. So peer educators actually explained how the information they were using to teach peers was important for other problems they saw, other contexts, and other relationships beyond the scope of service learning. So for instance, and this will really resonate if you are familiar with Love Notes, um, one participant or excuse me one peer educator said this experience also taught me a great deal of information about how to have healthy friendships and intimate relationships i personally am trying really hard to stop using invalidations such as don't be upset or it's not a big deal so this peer educator had a light bulb go off when they were learning about that topic of communication and was able to apply it to themselves and their relationships Moving on to number four, theme number four, peer educators seem to develop a greater awareness of the value of HMRE, specifically its impact, and they developed appreciation for the inner workings and strengths of delivering HMRE. In general, the, the sentiment was that they were impressed with the peer education framework they were um, surprised and impressed by participants' interest in enrolling in the course, meaning the participants who they taught to. And they were also kind of surprised, I think, um, by the level of effort it takes to de deliver this type of program. I think many of us can relate to that. We know it's a lot of work and it's worth it. Um, one peer educator explained that it was a very important curriculum to deliver. And they said, I also felt that the curriculum really did some magic. It was amazing watching the participants link course concepts back to each other and bring the program full circle. So another student also just directly said it. They said, I now see the uh, more of the internal workings of organizing something of this capacity, which I think is really important for them moving forward into the field. All right, our fifth theme related to this research question is civic engagement. Peer educators described how they perceived this experience as a form of giving back to their community in a meaningful way. So one uh, peer educator said that, I'm really glad we made such a big impact on, on some of these people and maybe even saved them physical or emotional pain. So they're recognizing the role they had in addressing a serious problem. Another participant or peer educator said that for the first time in a long time, they felt that they actually made a difference in someone's life because of the real program. And they got to help people in a new way they found they had a passion for, which is um, an important aspect of civic engagement. So overall, they experienced what it felt like to put their passions into action and give back to their campus community. The sixth theme and final theme for research question number one was uh, this idea called push to grow. And we actually drew this directly from the language one of the peer educators used. This captures the experience of personal and professional development that arose from sort of a push or a challenge. So it was a novel and at times really challenging experience for them. And so in this theme, they were really capturing um, how many of those conditions in the program helped push them to grow personally, such as it was a novel experience, they had a lot of group support, it was very structured, and they simply had the opportunity to just watch course concepts come to life, and so they grew and understood better these concepts. So for instance, um, one peer educator said, it was difficult at times, but well worth it. 
I do believe that most learning comes from getting out of one's comfort zone. And I did exactly that and I grew quite a bit. So overall, they were describing how they grew, mostly improving their confidence and their abilities as facilitators um, and deepening their academic learning. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Vanessa, who is going to share with you the findings for research question number two. All right, thanks, Alyssa. So since we had a little bit of a snafu earlier, I was like, I'm not turning off my camera, I'm muting myself. Um, but as a reminder, uh, research question two is focused on the interpersonal challenges and lessons learned of the peer educator experiences when they were delivering HMRE. And so if with a focus on the interpersonal challenges and lessons learned, we found that there were various interpersonal and inter intrapersonal challenges that really helped them grow. Um, one was this idea of like managing frustration towards a co-facilitator who had not adequately prepared to co-facilitate and learning to stay focused on the content when they were pressed for clarification from participants in the study. I'm sorry, participants in the program. Um, with this, we found that there were three main themes beginning with cooperative conflict management. So cooperative conflict management in this con context was as a service learning course, um, it was really focused on community and relationship building experiences that required the peer educators to work together effectively to be successful in program implementation. With this, the peer educators did not get to choose who they worked with. Um, they didn't get to choose who they worked with in the classroom, and they also didn't get to choose who they worked with for their teach back. So there was a random component here and also a component of time management and availability. So they had to coordinate outside of class time many times to prep, for example, for a teach back uh, for their course or to prep for going out to the community or classroom to teach the program. They also had to manage conflict with each other um, to work effectively or they could risk real time consequences when delivering the program. So as one peer educator shared, Learning to work in this capacity taught me a lot about other people and about what it takes to work with others in a professional setting. Another peer educator shared that the tension that was happening with the co-facilitator led to the audience being less engaged. And so this experience, although challenging, really helped to cultivate an awareness uh, for managing conflict in order to complete their responsibilities. Another theme was group cohesion. Group cohesion um, in this context led us to see that although there were challenges in the interpersonal dynamics, peer educators put a lot of thought into the benefits of the interpersonal nature of being. They talked about establishing a sense of belonging. They talked about having a shared purpose um, among their peers and a shared purpose to work collectively towards a goal. So for instance, we had a peer educator share that although they had other classes together with students that they were doing service learning with, they didn't really become close until this experience. They also talked about um, supporting each other and building each other up throughout the semester. And so, here, as you can see, we've demonstrated nine different meaningful themes that emerged through our analysis and our verification strategies. Some of these themes were unique to the HMRE experience, such as the a theme of having a newfound awareness for the value of healthy marriage and relationship education. Um, and then other themes that emerged really connect well to prior research on service learning and peer education, such as the theme of civic engagement. I, guys, I am so sorry. I have one more thing. We have reciprocal audience engagement. Um, and this is where peer educators experience the importance of building rapport with their audience and like the reciprocal nature of audience engagement. And so in this theme, our peer educators acknowledged their leadership role in creating a safe, open learning environment. They talked about their role in promoting participant engagement and they shared examples like when participants can relate to the educator and feel comfortable around them, they're more likely to share their own stories and attend more classes. So we found some real important implications from our study. Being a peer educator really created an in-depth personal and professional learning opportunity. 
The experiences we've highlighted today show the peer education model makes important contributions to developing up and coming family science professionals. As emerging adults, it's a great time. It's really relevant for our, our students. Um, our peer educators were able to have an opportunity outside of the classroom. They were able to take initiative in their own learning. And this experience really aligned well with their personal development as they learn new content that was relevant, but they also learned to overcome interpersonal challenges and successfully reach a collective goal in a professional setting. And then the personal impact and application of concepts described by our peer educators show that this experience also helped them to promote more positive health behaviors in their own lives. They were applying the HMRA content that they were teaching and learning when facilitating um, the program to their own relationships. Additionally, we find an emphasis on best practices and implementation should be encouraged by instructors of these experiences. Through this very structured peer education model, our peer educators gained a deeper understanding of career options within their discipline, such as family life education. They got to work through and reflect on their own professional interests and plans and actually you know, test it out, see what it was like out in the field. They learn effective strategies for working on teams and being engaged citizens, which are transferable in any, in any discipline, any field, any profession. And they learn components of healthy romantic relationships. Thanks, Vanessa. So I'm just gonna wrap this up with some big conclusions that we'll hope you'll take away from today about the um, use of a peer education framework for delivering HMRE programming. So number one, it helps to prepare emerging professionals to be more competent family science practitioners. We all want to have the up and coming professionals in our field to be as competent as possible. And this provided them with key hands-on skill development opportunities. It also can help to advance implementation science by promoting a potentially effective method for HMRE implementation among young adults. So we still need to collect data and understand the research behind the effectiveness for participants. But this is really illuminating what we talked about today, illuminates the um, impact it stands to have on our future professionals um, and how we may have a, a novel and important implementation method. So overall though, I think it really helped on campus to promote awareness of HMRE, both with our facilitators or peer educators, as well as the campus community, as we were very vocal about advertising it and sharing it on social media. Um, and then, you know, making sure that everyone understood the value of primary prevention, which is really what the Dibble Institute is so focused on with all the wonderful research-based curricula and programs they provide. So just to wrap up, I have a question for you. I would like to know what was most interesting or most important to you throughout this presentation? Like, did you have a light bulb moment during our talk? Um, something that stood out to you? If so, please share it in the chat box and our lovely MC moderator, Rachel, will help um, deliver that so we can all kind of hear what we're taking away from today's presentation. giving everyone a second to type in their responses. While I do that, would you mind if I kind of started this process of Q&A while of these course. responses yeah, are coming? Yeah, so in? that's what we have coming next is what questions can we answer? And also, I'll just share this as well, this plug for the presentation today. Um, Vanessa and I did publish this work in Family Relations Journal. So if you have access to that academic journal, you can uh, look us up in there and find more detail about this work. So while those are coming in, um, I noticed kind of in the beginning of the presentation, some of the things that you talked about as being helpful um, and that was reinforced was talking about this preparation, these preparation tips and how they learned a lot during the preparation process. And you kind of highlighted a little bit about your process, um, but if you could maybe speak to the process a bit more of how you help them prepare and maybe ways that you encourage them to prepare outside of your sessions together, because it sounds like that 
made a difference. And I think it could be effective regardless of if someone's implementing a peer education model or not. Yeah, so um, I think you're talking about our weekly meetings mm -hmm. and how we extended their practicing yeah. outside of those. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, so basically we would encourage them to practice to their peers. So there's like a little subtle way that they were helping their peers outside of the program, but practicing with their roommates, um, they could practice co-facilitating together before a teach back session, but um, they were required to do so prior to an actual session. And so they did spend a lot of time together outside of those uh, class hours, essentially, that 90 minutes was their class time. So, yep, they were outside of the class working together on that. And then with the teach back process, um, could you just highlight that a little bit more and speak to exactly what that Look like. I know you said it was random, so everybody had to prepare, but maybe a little bit about the types of feedback that you were looking for and how they practice. Like, do they practice a whole lesson, pieces, that kind of stuff? Yeah, great question. So at times we didn't have enough time in that 90 minutes to cover everything. And so we would do things that were particularly challenging. So, you know, being able to deliver information in an engaging way could be practiced outside of class time, right? just making your voice sound exciting, hand gestures. However, leading a discussion is something that's very challenging and needs to happen in real time and be practiced in real time with real time feedback. So leading discussions, giving instructions, asking questions, and running through some of the more challenging activities, maybe where participants get up and move around, where there's lots of things going on. Those specific activities were absolutely a part of the teach back process. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. I just think sometimes people are looking at like, how do I help my team get most prepared outside of a training? What can I do after that to help keep that process going? Absolutely. Um, I would say doing mock, mock demonstrations or mock presentations of those challenging pieces is probably the, the most helpful uh, method for those participants or for the peer educators. So I'm getting those responses. People are loving how you use students and practice the peer education model um, and offered a service learning opportunity. They're interested in navigating conflicts. Okay, so we're getting we're getting the things that they learned alongside questions. So I think we'll kind of bring those, those pieces together. Um, so one of the questions that we have is whether you've had any of the peer educators kind of have maybe a response to some of the material. So some of those big emotions maybe to some of the content that they're teaching. And if so, you know, how was that handled essentially if someone was having a difficult time with some of the content? That's a great question. Um, and I think it's really important because as novice facilitators themselves, they may not recognize going into it what kinds of personal factors might interact with the experience. So just like with the participants of the program, we obviously would, or I would provide them with those resources that we have here on campus, like student counseling, um, but also I would encourage them to bring that to me privately, not in full, I never asked for a lot of details, but just if something's going on that is causing you personal distress, I am not going to make you teach that lesson, right? If there's a particular topic, we can talk about that and I'll rearrange the schedule. So being open to that and having awareness of it, going into it as the program leader, I think was an essential uh, way to make sure they felt comfortable managing it on their own and they felt supported. So it sounds like you would make those accommodations for them if that were to come up. So the keeping them in the program. Yeah, resources and accommodations if needed. Okay, so another question about the service learning opportunity was around the marketing. So um, was it all through social media or how else did you recruit and what was your average class size? Uh, Great question. So our classroom seats about 25 students. So on average, we had about 12. So some classes were full and some, I think one class we had six people. So it ranged, but the average was 12 across those four semesters. Um, in terms of marketing and recruitment, the students, if they felt comfortable, would put up social media posts, kind of advertising the program. They would make announcements um, throughout campus. So if they were in a you know, fraternity or sorority, they would announce it there. Student athlete, they would announce it there. Um, we also would have them visit classes like the major psychology courses, sociology, those big, big lecture halls. They would either visit it or ask that instructor to announce the opportunity. 
Awesome. So it sounds like lots of different ways to recruit. So the another question. I did track this. I tracked it. Word of mouth. Okay. Word of mouth was the number one way that we recruited participants is what they said. That's how they heard about it. Not flyers, not social media, just their friend saying, hey, have you heard Using of it? their new communication skills that they learned while working in the program. Yeah. Um, so with that, I think this leads perfectly into the next uh, question that we have was, you know, you had mentioned that they were noting some conflicts or maybe difficulties between co-facilitators that would come up sometimes for different reasons. Um, so were there ways that you trained them to navigate those conflicts when they arose? Like what skills did you help them with for navigating that? Um, that's a great question. Anyone who's been an instructor of college students knows that with group work comes the opportunity for interpersonal challenges. And this was a big group project. So I would always name that. I would say it may be challenging and you may have some difficulties with one another. Here are some pointers I have for communicating, just offering ideas for that. Um, but there, other than just kind of basic tips and addressing it when it did come up, I didn't offer specific training on that. Yeah, we didn't have the capacity necessarily for like a specific um, how to work with your peers uh, training. They were learning lots of skills and sounds like having to practice communication skills. I think so. In I, 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 would, I would just send them the lessons and say, hey, read this first. <laughs> yeah. you, you know, practice that WWA skill that we exactly, just exactly. <laughs> in the Don't program. Do danger signs. <laughs> yes, exactly. No communication danger signs. Um, let's See, we've got some more comments about critical thinking of profession being implemented and activated by participants. Uh, people are noting seeing the power of service and the difference that that really has, has made is um, calling them to action as well, it sounds like. So those are some of the things that jumped out. Um, I think one of the other things that came up that might be helpful for anybody who's also doing a similar peer delivery model is you mentioned some of the, the challenges that they talked about were tips for balancing their role as a facilitator when they are with their peers. Um, were there any tips that they brought up or anything that you might recommend for navigating and walking that fine line? Um, so balancing that role, a big thing that I did directly talk to them about was boundaries and what that looks like um, and how when somebody, because this is one of the challenges, like Vanessa, if you think back to our days doing this, there are students in the room at the time we were teaching or doing the program with high school students, they would challenge the facilitator. That's wrong. I don't agree with that. My cousin did this and they're fine, right? I think most of us can relate to that who've delivered these programs. Well, if that happens when it's someone you're almost your exact same age or maybe in some instances a little bit older than you, it can be really challenging to come back and say, uh, I don't really, uh, I don't know what to do, but you're you're wrong, like <laughs> this curriculum's right. And so I essentially, you know, in more professional ways of saying you're wrong, it's right. I would ask them to lean on the curriculum. If any time someone challenged them or they felt like there was a bump with a participant, I would say lean on the curriculum. Go back to those seven principles, go back to the communication patterns, like go back to that. And you as a as yourself, you don't have to argue them. Like you're just gonna say, hey, well, what we're teaching today is this. That's what we endorse, right? So they would take that away as like, okay, well, you know, I didn't win my argument, but I guess they might have a point. That was like the least confront confrontational way to handle it. And we did have some times where participants were like, I don't like that language. Like very direct about it. I don't like the way you're talking about that. And so students, another thing I always encourage is curiosity. Tell me why you don't think that language is working. What's going on? And if there's time, they can tell you a little more. You could ask to talk to them after the session. Love so that. Really, get curious. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, being so. curious. Okay. Well, with that being said, we are on our final like 30-ish seconds. So I want to go ahead and let you all know, well, thanks to our presenters first for giving us this perspective and um, opening up this world of peer education to folks and letting them know that it can work and be really successful for their participants and the educators as well. 
And I also want to thank everybody for joining us on today's webinar. Um, there will be a brief survey. We're going to ask you to complete it. It should not take long. You will get an email for that. Um, so please make sure you complete, or I think it might populate immediately, actually. Um, so please make sure to provide your feedback there. Also, this webinar will be available in three days. You can find it on our website. It will also be emailed to you. If you have questions about this webinar, our programs, or anything else, please feel free to email us at relationshipskills at dibbleinstitute.org. I do want to highlight that we have our webinar coming up next month. Uh, so I just want to draw your attention to what's to come for our next second Wednesday webinar, which will be October 11th. And we're going to be looking at three years later, the impact of Relationship Smarts Plus on youth in Georgia. So please join us for that. And um, on that note, thanks everyone again. And we look forward to seeing you at next month's webinar. Thank you. <laughs> thanks.